everybody this morning. I guess there's never been a better time than what we've just experienced recently to understand how the brain works, particularly regarding change and threat. And that's what we're going to unpack today. How do we get the best out of our brains? How do we get the best as leaders and managers out of the brains of all the people that we're working with? So we're going to draw from the field of neuroscience. And essentially, that's going to help us lead ourselves and others more effectively in a whole range of different areas. Today, I'm going to summarize our NeuroTread framework, and that stands for how to think, regulate, engage, adapt, and develop with the brain in mind. In this framework, we've been successfully using for over 10 years in corporate Australia and throughout Asia. So what does that stand for? NeuroTread is how to, uh, how to do more effective decision making and problem solving so that you're more insightful and effective, you're more resilient and calm under pressure is regulate, you're being able to motivate, inspire and engage your team members more effectively, you're able to lead through change and help yourself and your team members change, and you're able to have performance enhancing conversations to develop team members through great coaching and excellent feedback. Overall, the thing I've always been passionate about is transforming managers into agile leaders of change and performance. And let's face it, it's not very easy today to be a great leader, particularly with everybody having to suddenly remote work and now being a remote leader. So let's understand how the brain works a little bit and it gives us some insight around what's happening for us and also what's happening for our team members. So what I'd like to do is just share my trusty spare brain here as a way of just understanding some of the key structures. The first structure I'd like to talk about is the prefrontal cortex. You may be familiar with this. It's your conscious part of the brain. It's where you do your executive functions, like you decide, analyze, recall, inhibit, plan, strategize. This part of the prefrontal cortex is actually only very small, 4% of the mass of the human brain, yet it consumes most of the glucose that you require every day for the brain functioning. Blood flow brings it the oxygen and glucose it requires, which is the fuel for the prefrontal cortex. So it's your working memory as well. Now, some of us have brains that work pretty efficiently, and let's face it, we're all working hard and long hours. But actually, research found we've actually only got four peak hours of prefrontal cortex activity every day. Some of us are morning people, some of us are afternoon, and some of us are evening. In fact, from the polls that I've done, probably at least 10,000 people, we found about 70% of people are morning people, about 20% afternoon people, and 10% evening people. So have a think, how is your day organized and whether you're a morning, afternoon, or an evening person? If you've got back-to-back -back meetings and you're a morning person from the morning, maybe rethink that. Bring some strategy, planning, organizing time back into the morning and have some of your meetings that are less important in the afternoon potentially. So that's the prefrontal cortex, an important part of us being human. The next part of the brain that's important to look at is the limbic system. Now the limbic system is an older, deeper structure in the brain and processes all our emotions. Five times a second, the brain is scanning the environment for whether something is a threat or a reward. Threat, reward, threat, reward, threat, reward, threat, reward, threat, reward, like that. And this is happening non-consciously, but as soon as it detects a threat, that could be our emails, it could be person, it could be car coming into our laneway, whatever it is, essentially what happens is blood flow heads away from the prefrontal cortex via the amygdala. Now, the amygdala, a key part of the limbic system, is responsible for our fight, flight, freeze response. This is the part of the brain that renders us not able to speak properly or getting aggressive or angry or frustrated or saying something sarcastic when we shouldn't, etc. So this part of the brain is important for us in survival. Without it, we wouldn't be able to detect and organize ourselves to get into that fight, flight, freeze. However, in today's environment, it looks like we're facing amygdala hijacks regularly. And when I ask, how's your amygdala lately? A lot of people, when I ask what's been happening, basically the amygdala grows. The more you experience threat, the more your amygdala grows. And the more, your amygdala, the more you experience threat, the more your amygdala grows, the more your amygdala grows, the more you experience threat. This is what can make us hypervigilant for threat. Always scanning for threat. You know, somebody says, good morning. You say, what do you mean? You say, no, 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 just good morning. That's like an example of an, an overactive amygdala. In fact, post-traumatic stress disorder is basically an enlarged amygdala. Um, 
So what happens in terms of how the brain actually works and functions on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm just going to draw this up here, is that what they found, neuroscientists essentially have found, I'm just going to put the brain down, what they found is that there's an inverse relationship between blood flow in the prefrontal cortex and blood flow in the amygdala. So what happens is when we've detected there's a threat in the environment, unfortunately, our amygdala organizes that blood flow to head south to the heart, lungs and limbs for the fight, flight, freeze response. So it's dashing away from the prefrontal cortex and we get puffed up lungs, limbs, and we can punch somebody or we can run really fast or what have you, but we can't think straight. So the problem is when we've noticed a threat, whatever that is, and we as leaders, if we notice a threat and we share that threat, frustration, nervous, worried, anxious, concerned, anytime you're feeling any of those emotions, you spread that threat state throughout your team because emotions are also highly contagious non-consciously. So what do we do about this as a leader, being aware of this? Well, first of all, we can have some reactive strategies. And the main thing I wanna share with you here is one reactive strategy called BLAH, breathe, label, reappraise. First of all, if you take a deep breath, you're adding oxygen back to the prefrontal cortex. If you then label the emotion, give it a name, I'm feeling frustrated, nervous, worried, anxious, annoyed, just one. Um, then you're able to re-engage the prefrontal cortex and it dampens the limbic response, just like this. If you re-engage the PFC, it dampens the amygdala. And then by the time you do step three, reappraise, this is where you ask yourself, how can I look at this differently? Or what's the positive here? Or what can I gain from this? Or how do I put this into perspective? Or even how can I look at this from somebody else's perspective? As you do that, Again, you're re-engaging your prefrontal cortex and dampening the amygdala response, giving you again greater capacity to solve the problem in a creative way. When you're in a threat state, your peripheral vision narrows, you have less insights, you take less risks, you're less connected to others and you're problems oriented. When you're in a reward state, you are open to risk, take more, uh, open to risk, have more insights, more connected to others, uh, and have um, more solution orientation to your problem solving. So if we think about it as a manager, just understanding this, your own state and the state of your team members, for peak mental performance, we need ourselves and our team members to be in a reward state as much as possible. That's high performance. In fact, research has showed that high performing teams absolutely show that if you're feeling, if they're feeling more valued, proud, optimistic, cheerful, and loved, then overall you're going to get higher performance out of them. So essentially, well, I'm just going to stop my annotate. There we go. And so Let's have a look at what does throw us into threat and reward faster than anything else in a social setting. The first thing is autonomy. This is access to social motivators. We summarize it. Autonomy, certainty, connection, quality, status, and safety. I'd like you to have a think about which ones of these matter most to you, because they may be different from your team members. Autonomy is the fact that the brain wants a choice. If we get a choice, a say in the matter, we have greater potential for survival. So if you're, for example, micromanaging somebody, not giving them a choice about when to meet, that can throw them into a threat state. How important is autonomy for you? Certainty. The brain is a prediction machine. It likes to know what's coming up next. When it doesn't, it can get in a threat state quite easily. COVID obviously threw us all into a massive threat state. Why we went, ended up buying heaps of toilet paper because our narrow thinking, you know, our less connection to others. I need my, I need my toilet paper. So this is what happens when we're in a threat state. And you as a leader, it's important for you to be thinking, what can I do to create more certainty for my team members, particularly all this remote work, back to work, et cetera. Um, this is an important role for us as leaders. How important is certainty for you? Connection. We love to connect with others, but some of us like to do it more than others. So some people like to come in or chat. How was your weekend? What did you get up to? How's your daughter, etc. That's high connection. Other people, they connected on the weekend. I don't want to talk about that now. I just want to get into the work. You know, where are we at with that client briefing, etc. So how are you on connection? Where does that rank for you? 
equality. If you talk about equality and fairness a lot, then it's a big one for you. If you don't, if you say, you know what, all's fair in love and war, life's not fair, giddy up, that's what we're gonna deal with, then equality and fairness may not be a big driver for you. Status, some of us love recognition and feedback. We like to hear job well done, that looks great, uh, fantastic outcome with that client. And other people are like, I don't really need that comparison thing, compare myself to myself or to others. But if you measure your sense of achievement, if you like to have some sense of being able to gauge where you're at, whether that be feedback from others or feedback from yourself, then status may be an important one for you. And then finally, safety. Many of us like to feel very safe before we can actually relax and tell people and share with people our vulnerable side. And other people are like, hi, nice to meet you. Just tell you anything you want to know. Ask me anything and I'll tell you it all. So it's important for us to recognize ourselves. Where do we sit on safety? How comfortable are we with others versus others? How many in our team may need a little more time to feel trust and, uh, and authenticity before they let their guard down and share their vulnerability? So one of the key things that's useful to do here is take a moment to think about whether or not your top one or two are different to your team members. When we've done these over a range of a time with many hundreds and thousands of people, we've actually found that there is such a significant diversity. In fact, in a room full of 200 people, as I would often do as a keynote speaker, we would find there are equal groups of people who chose autonomy, certainty, connection, equality, status and safety as their top drivers. So have a think for yourself, which two would you say would be your top two if you had to pick them out of those six? Take a moment. And then also, which one would you say would be your bottom two? The ones in the middle, yeah, they're not so much your drivers and they don't really throw you into threat or reward so much, but your bottom two are also equally important. Why? Because it, usually we find that if your bottom two, say for example, certainty is at your bottom or connection is at your bottom, what happens is if it doesn't matter to you, you don't tend to realize how, how much it matters for others. So you may not give others certainty. You may not say, how was your weekend? But you may have somebody in your team, connection's their number one, might be your number six. But what happens then, hey, where are you at with that client report? You've thrown them into a massive threat state, even though that's how you would like to be treated. So it's important for us to just adjust and recognize, A, our social motivators are not necessarily the same as others. And B, if our social motivator ranks low for ourselves, there's a likely chance we don't do very well at creating a reward state for others. Now, if you think about the whole concept of coaching, which we're going to talk about, or co coaching, coaching does tend to give people the ability to have autonomy, have certainty, connection at a deeper level, equality and status. We're asking, not telling. We're building status through feedback and we're creating a sense of safety by really getting to know people. So we're going to have a look at how we can utilize coaching as one of the key ways that we can A, provide that safe environment and B, get people into the high performance that we're really after. And we're needing to do that differently now. Obviously, many people are doing remote coaching. And what we've found is that a lot of people are actually having those whips, those catch-ups on task but we're actually not having as much of the coaching conversations, the developing high performance, the helping people with their career progression, and even helping people solve their own problems. Those things have gone by the wayside a little bit and we've become more manager rather than leader in this remote world. We need to bring that back again. So let's have a look what we need to do for that. First of all, we need to recognize that our brain like solving problems. So if somebody comes to us with a problem, there's parts of our brain that basically zero in and say, right, I can solve that. And we will ask people questions about the problem. We will tell people about the problem and we will then tell them the solution. In fact, that bottom right quadrant is sort of where we tend to do most of our activity. Whereas if we actually spend a bit more time asking them about the solution, then we're more likely to help have people have insights. And insights are those aha moments that are empowering. In fact, you get a dopamine hit when you have an insight. And insights occur, well, when I ask around, where do you usually have your insights? People say in the shower, in the loo, uh, in bed, um, 
in transport or exercise. Well, great. If we want to have insights with our team members, we need to find opportunities to have that in a conversation. And all of those things have in common alpha brain waves, very quiet brain waves. It's a relaxed brain state. So how do we do that in coaching environment? What we essentially need to do is ask questions what they're about what they're thinking. We ask questions like, what do you want to achieve out of this? And what sort of thinking are you doing? If we can ask people about the solution rather than assume that just because they come to us, we should give them the solution, then we're able to delegate problem solving. We're able to increase the amount people have insights. We empower others, we motivate, and we develop talent. And by the way, if you coach with compassion, neuroscience shows that it actually builds your immune system because it activates your parasympathetic nervous system. So coaching, the framework for coaching, there's one that's been around for a long time. It's called GROW. It stands for goals, reality, options, and what next? If we're gonna ask questions, let's ask where you wanna be, like what's the client outcome you're after, or what are you wanting to see in three months, or what's, what would you like to see regarding your work-life balance over the next month or so working from home? Goals don't have to be this massive future thing. They can be a right here, like what do you wanna get out of this conversation? The reality, where are you at now? The options, you know, what options have we got to get there? And what will you do next? And we essentially have also introduced to a lot of uh, organizations, a brain-based version of the GROW model, and that's called GROWWISE. If you think about it, the GROW model can be a good structural model, but it can tend to be a little surface oriented if not done well. And what we understand about human beings is that we're much more complex than the tip of the iceberg. The tip of the iceberg is what we see, you know, the skills, the behaviours, etc. But actually beneath the surface lurks all our feelings, our thinking, our fears, our values, our belief system, our barriers. And if we don't have conversations around that, we are essentially not able to transform people and really lead through change. We'll get uh, some sort of transactional change, but not a change in belief or mindset or ability based on a new way of looking at things, especially getting over our, our own boundaries. So whole brain goal setting, essentially we do a lot of smart goals. I'm not gonna go through all of these for time, but just to go through that one, smart goals, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic timeframe, very much a left brain orientation from a goal setting perspective. What's missing? emotion and creativity. So if we ask somebody, what would that look like for you to achieve that? Interestingly enough, that creates alpha brain waves, which is the quiet brains that help brain waves that help us have an insight. And also if we ask how important is that for you, then essentially we're activating and, and empowering the part of the brain that gets excited about the goal. What would this mean to you? What's your driver? What's your why for this goal? We don't ask this, we ask smart goals. So we need to ask smart goals and safe. See it, accept it, feel it and express it. Essentially, what do you want to achieve and by when? But what would that look like and what would that mean to you? And as we go through the Grow Wise model, essentially all of this is about helping people have insights, aha moments, new ways of thinking, not just, I don't know how to solve this problem, go to the manager, the manager will tell me, but help them in problem solving so that they get much more effective in that every day, all day. When we ask people the options, don't just ask them the, what's your immediate options? They'll give you what's in their prefrontal cortex. It's a very small part of the brain. Ask them what else? What would Richard Branson do? If you were really courageous, what would you do here? Stretch for the subconscious. People will go, ah, and they'll look away and northward. Why? Again, they're trying to make the weak connections. They're trying to have an insight, allow for that opportunity. And then what next? Explore. Let's look at the barriers. What's going to stop you from doing what you say you're going to do? And use implementation intentions to get over those barriers. If that's going to stop you, then what will you do? three times more likely to get into action than if we don't explore the barriers. So this Grow Wise model is a coaching model that's derived essentially from the best of what we've always done in coaching, as well as understanding how the brain solves problems, have in, has insights, utilizes our non-conscious, gets into action, is motivated, etc. And that just really spells out, I guess, the best ways that we can have everyday conversations with our team members. And let's face it, with all the people that we're working with, a lot of people are having those whip conversations and where are you up to and how can I help you this week? But not as much the, what are the goals that we're working on? What are the things that you wanna achieve and, and, and improve on? Where are you headed, etc. And let's touch base on those every few weeks 
in a coaching conversation to develop you. And in summary, what I'd like to say is that overall, our TREAD framework really looks at you being able to identify when do you need to be manager and when do you need to be leader? And knowing about, about how the brain works gives you that opportunity to actually move between them. You want to lead with reward rather than manage by the have to do, the threat. You want to be as much insight driven as logic driven. You want to be resilient rather than just manage under pressure and emotionally intelligent, not just cognitively intelligent. You want to be able to be as people focused as you are task focused and motivate rather than control. And you want to be able to do all of this with a growth mindset rather than a fixed mindset, being able to pick that up in yourself and others and being able to reappraise or reframe people's thinking including your own, to be able to have that growth mindset. And finally, when you're developing people, you want to ask, not tell. And, remember and, ask, not tell. Ants have great leverage. Think about the leverage you can get by asking rather than telling and generate insight and empower others. So that's a pretty much just a little summary of our framework in a short space of time. I'm going to hand it now to Suzanne for some questions. Thanks, Kristen. So we know that the amygdala is a part of the brain that's associated with processing emotion that grows, but can you shrink your amygdala? Yeah, absolutely. That's the number one question we get asked all the time. Um, essentially, you can shrink your amygdala. If your amygdala has been growing because you've been overactive lately, then what you can do is A, the reactionary strategy, blah, breathe, label, reappraise. But also we found, or neuroscience has found, that diet, sleep, exercise, brain breaks every hour and a half. Take, go on, but come off. Go on, but come off. Don't just stay on all day. It's not effective for the brain. And mindfulness as well has been proven to be really effective in regulating emotions, bringing back that activation from the amygdala quite quickly. So yeah, practice some mindfulness. There's great apps, you know, Smiling Mind, Buddha Fire, et cetera. That's another great way to really build your ability to regulate emotions and shrink your amygdala. We, we did have actually a, a great comment from Angela via Zoom chat, which was, I say to my kids, if you can name it, you can tame it. So that's a good one. 100%. And that's the labelling aspect because that allows the non-conscious, we experience emotions non-consciously, but as soon as we label it, we give it a conscious tag, I'm feeling, versus it just being an emotion. And that enables us to change it. Once we're conscious of it, we can shift it, reappraise it, change it, or enjoy it and not change it, but it gives us that option. Thank you. Great. So Kristen, you did talk about social motivators. So how do you find out what the social motivators are of your team? So what are their threatened states and what do they need? Yeah, great. So this is another thing that's really great conversation to have. If you want to get beneath the iceberg and you want to create a good sense of belonging in your team, which is the number one thing that Deloitte has found that people are needing, particularly in remote, have real conversations with your team members. Share with them the access model, the autonomy, the certainty, etc., and just start a conversation. See in a group chat like this, for example, who thinks autonomy is important or who thinks certainty is important? And as you're having that conversation, you will start to see the ranking. Then let the, your team members actually give you the rank and ask them, which ones do you think are the most important to you and which are the least important? Once you've been able to do that, you'll be able to also adjust the way that you lead, have meetings, run your coaching based on the social motivators of your team members. Great. Um, so all of us are time poor. So if I only have a few minutes, how do I coach effectively? Yeah. Uh, look, people say I don't have time to coach. No, a lot of people don't. But you don't have time not to coach because you're not going to be developing thinkers if you don't coach. You're only going to come from your vantage point, which is the tried and tested, but not necessarily the useful, agile, innovative of the future. So what we need to do is just whenever somebody comes to us with a challenge, a, something they're stuck on, is we just need to ask them a goal-oriented question. What outcome are you after here? What would you like to see for your client as a result of this, um, this particular project? Whatever. And then what thinking have you been doing so far? Just two questions can send you into a coaching mode. See what their thinking is, work with that, and that's you coaching. Wonderful. So how do we perform um, in a high-performance team? So how do we form those habits for high-performance teams? 
Oh, yeah, great. So neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to change itself is the greatest discovery in neuroscience in the last 400 years. Essentially, we can create new strong neural connections. We have 100 billion neurons and they're all connected with 1,000 to 100,000 connections. And they've all formed super highways and tiny little laneways. And if we want to form a new habit or help our team member form a new habit, we have to pay loads of attention and positive feedback to the small incremental little laneways, the little pathways that have come off the super highways, and that will help strengthen and create a little suburban road up to a highway by the time that becomes a habit. So we need to think of our brain as constantly changing. You know, a mind once stretched by a new idea never regains its original dimensions. So we need to be thinking of neuroplasticity. We can change, but we need to have it form by being clear on the goal, loads of attention and positive feedback. And that's where coaching really makes a huge difference for our team members to generate high performance habits. Thanks, Kristen. So we have another question from Osman and he's asking, how much culture, how much does culture influence on the access drivers? How much does? Culture. Influence. Actually, I don't know, but I would say certainly it does. There are definitely people who are more drawn to certain industries, who have come from different backgrounds, etc., who probably find some of those more comfortable to align to than others. So status, for example, the word itself is not ideal. It really probably should be more recognition. But status, for example, is, is certainly not looked on as one of the for, for certain cultures, not looked as one as a, an important one to say, yeah, I want some status for sure. And equality and fairness is also a very important one for others in different cultures as well. So I think it does play an absolutely important role, but I don't know the research in terms of which cultures are more likely to have one or the other. Certainly we see it in industry as well as management level, different pref um, preferences for those. In senior leadership, for example, we get a lot of autonomy requirements, a lot of need for autonomy, which is no surprise. But mid-level managers, we actually find there's an equal mix across the, the, all of them rather than a, a high drive for autonomy. Wonderful. Thank you for that summary. That's all we've got time for for questions today. Thank you, Kristen, for the Q&A and back to you. Okay, great, thanks. Just to summarise then, in a nutshell, if you want to get the best out of yourself and your team members, then it's great to understand how this works a little bit. It drives every piece of your behaviour and their behaviour every single day. So neuroscience now can shed light on how you can do more effective problem solving and decision making, how you can have more of those aha moments, insights, when you like, how you like them to solve the complex problems, how to regulate emotions and how to help others regulate emotions, bring you back out of threat into reward state, how to motivate, inspire, engage others, and how to have performance enhancing conversations and feedback that really lift performance and drive change, as well as being able to lead through effective change. So that's our NeuroTread framework, as well as the research that's out there today and available that's um, really fascinating um, uh, to be able to unpack how you work and how your team members work at a deeper level. So thanks very much. I'll hand that back over to Tony to continue and to wrap up our webinar. Thank you, Kristen, for those insights. You've packed an amazing amount of information into such a short time frame. Our follow-up email will include a link to the recording of today's presentation and also some additional resources to help you further explore this topic. Macquarie Business School offers a range of short courses in management and leadership and our contact details are showing on the screen now. We do offer a short course in neuroscience and leadership. Thanks everyone for participating in today's webinar and thank you, Kristen, again. We keep your eye out for future short courses and webinars offered by Macquarie Business School. Thank you.